There's a right time to find out if you have the right insurance. And it's not when you have a fender bender or frozen pipes. No, the best time is before something goes wrong. Like when you first talk to a AAA insurance agent. And they're taking the time to get to know what you need. So that if the unexpected happens to your car or home, you won't get unexpected answers. Talk to a AAA insurance agent at your local AAA store today. Or visit AAA.com slash insurance to learn more about AAA. Prepare for glory! I don't know if you got your pop on there. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Football Roundtable Podcast, proud members of the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. You can find them at FTF Podnet on Twitter. You can find me at SportsFanaticMB on Twitter. We are just one of a many great podcasts that you have on this uh, this network. You can find Jim Day of FF Champs, Adam Ronis and Dr. Roto from SiriusXM Radio, Bob Lung of the award-winning Fantasy Football Consistency Guide, Dwayne McFarland, Blake Sullivan, and a ton of other great fantasy football podcast where you get all of your advice, news, strategies, anything you need. It's a one-stop shop, and you can find all of it at FullTimeFantasy.com. We've got a nice and easy episode for you guys today. Mr. Matthew Fox will be joining me here in just a minute, and we are going to go all over all of the key injuries that happened yesterday, and then we will preview both of the Monday Night Football games tonight between the Houston Texans and the New Orleans Saints and the Oakland Raiders and the Denver Broncos. So without further ado, let's get Matt in here and let's start talking about some of these injuries and the Monday Night Football doubleheader. <laughs> And we've got Mr. Matthew Fox with us. Matt, how uh, how was your Sunday of uh, or first NFL full slate Sunday of football? And then how uh, how have your fantasy matchups been shaking out for you? Uh, my, mine have, have not been good. It's been a pretty horrible weekend all around with the uh, with the Browns just getting spanked, and then pretty much so of all of my fantasy teams. Yeah, it was uh, rough when we started the first games in the morning, so I kind of gave up looking and I didn't really go back to uh, see what the damage was going to be until after the afternoon games and that actually worked out for me pretty well I was heavily invested in the cowboy passing game which uh, did me some favors yeah uh, and that bomb to Tyler Lockett kind of helped uh, a couple of my teams as well so it wasn't too bad really enjoyed the red zone experience uh, some games I thought I had no interest in on Sunday I ended up watching for hours yeah that's um one of my favorite things about now, I haven't really had this experience of the past couple of years of, of the Browns playing in prime time, but when the Browns play prime time um, or have their bye week, it is one of the things I enjoy because I can really kind of focus on a bunch of games where usually I watch, even if the Browns defense is going to be bad, I tend to try and watch that entire game, offense and defense, and we'll switch back and forth between commercials to red zone. So, But with, uh, with again, the, the beatdown that we suffered there on Sunday – I'd say about eight minutes into the fourth quarter, I was able to really enjoy a lot of close football games because there were some, surprisingly, uh, that went on, though. I, I could have swore the, the Titans looked like they were playing a high school JV team this past Sunday, so it was it was not pretty. But we, hey, we will definitely at see. At least you're not the Dolphins. That, I mean, we were pretty damn close. We only put up like three more points than them, so I'm not going to, I mean, it. I really won't, it, as much as I'm going to give them crap right now, I don't think it was as bad a game as the score indicates. It was only like a two-point game going into the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter was just a complete meltdown, but we will get into all of that uh, when we do our, our recaps of all of the, the, the games that happened Sunday, uh, which we will be focusing on later. So let's go ahead and, and jump right into the breaking news, which we will use as today's segment and to jump in and talk about all of the, the, the key injuries that happened yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. 
So we had quite a few possibly significant injuries that happened yesterday, and we'll start at the QB positions. There was just two big ones. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Baker and, and, and Mahomes, since neither one of those are serious. Uh, Baker hurt wrist. He had a soft cast when leaving the game yesterday, but x-rays came out today and said everything is fine. I imagine he will be fine moving forward. Uh, and Patrick Mahomes, this one is a little bit interesting to me. This is one of the two that I think is kind of a big deal. He has, a, has an ankle sprain. It's likely going to be okay, but with the guy that is as mobile as he is around the pocket and maneuvering out of the pocket to make plays, this could be a big deal. Granted, he has a cannon, so it's probably not going to take that much off the fastball there, but it is something to watch because as someone who's dealt with their fair amount of ankle sprains in his life, one little one, while it may be minor at this point, if it's twisted again, could become fairly serious. Uh, Matt, do you have any... Any thoughts on either one of these issues, or issues, my goodness, injuries, before we move on to the big one for the Jaguars? Yeah, I mean, I watched a fair amount of that game because I was going back and forth to it on Red Zone, and it looked like he was able to move around and make uh, the passes he needed to in time. But usually with those kind of injuries, it's not the game where you get injured that's the concern. It's after you go home, you sit up on ice, you go to sleep, and then you wake up and have pain during the week. I had wondered going into the season if uh, some of the offensive lineman pieces they lost, remember they lost their center, Mitch Morse, some of those things were going to take a toll and seeing obviously the Jaguars were playing pretty physical, um, but seeing if that takes a toll, I think it definitely bears watching. The good news if you're a, a Chiefs fan is their running game looked pretty good. Damian Williams scored a touchdown, McCoy 8.1 yards per carry, so they may actually have some alternatives. Yeah, uh, so the big one it happened in that same game was Nick Foles. He got hit by, I believe it was Chris Jones, on a beautiful touchdown pass to G.J. Chark as well. And uh, unfortunately, with the way that Jones landed on Nick Foles, it was one of those that we saw with Aaron Rodgers just a couple years ago. Unfortunately, kind of landed with all of his body weight on Nick Foles, uh, and he injured his shoulder. He did have surgery Um I don't believe they put him on any kind of IR yet. I believe it was just you said it was, I believe you have on here is a short term IR. So I don't think he's going on that yet. Regardless, he's not going to be back anytime soon. I was watching a fair amount of that game as well. I thought Gardner Minshew looked amazing in that game. They did trade for Joshua Dobbs earlier today, the fifth round with for a conditional fifth round pick. I don't think that Dobbs has any chance of starting here. I think it's going to be all Gardner Minshew. Uh, and again, we'll address this a little bit more when we do recaps, but he's a guy, if you're in a deeper league or two QB league, I would definitely pick up uh, because I liked what he, or the, I liked the way he looked in the parts of the game that I saw. Matt, what were your thoughts on the Nick Foles injury and Gardner Minshew? Yeah, Foles, I guess, has suffered this injury before they referenced this was uh, similar to what happened to him in 2014 when he was with the Eagles. Um, I know they haven't made a move yet. There was a lot of talk that they were going to look at to see whether it made sense to put him on IR with the designation to return. I think if he had surgery, that would probably make sense for them. I'm with you. I view Do the trade for Dobbs as just trying to go get a quality backup. I think they're definitely going to go with Minshew. They felt comfortable with him being the number two behind Foles, and they did that for a reason. I thought he looked good. Uh, I'd like to see in future games, I don't think the Chiefs have that good of a defense. I think yeah. their defense is somewhat suspect, so it's hard. You know, that might be one you take with a grain of salt. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, and I really do. Um, I really, like I said, I, I liked Minshew, and, and I think that he's going to be fine moving forward. I, I do kind of agree with you what you say that the Chiefs' defense is not that good, so maybe that is why Minshew looked as good as he did. But, I mean, he does have a lot of weapons around him. Uh, if Leonard Fournette can get going, I think Minshew will be just fine. Move on to the running back position. Uh, we've got Joe Mixon with an ankle injury. Uh, the MRI, we haven't heard anything on the MRI, but I did see a report earlier saying that he is likely going to be fine, but still nothing on the MRI results. Tevin Coleman, ankle injury. Uh, but his was a high ankle sprain. Breida got dinged up too, but he was playing I mean, I feel like Breida was injured in every game last year and kept playing. So Breida and uh, Raheem Mostert look like to be the guys right there for now. And then uh, Darius Geis, a knee injury. There's been a lot of reports going back and forth on this. Some saying that he could be done uh, for a while, for a year, for a couple weeks. The last one I saw is that... 
They say that he's dealing with a meniscus injury, and they're hoping it's just a sprain Well, he'll only miss a few weeks, but they have not said for sure yet. So that one is the most concerning to me. Obviously, most of you, if you have guys, probably don't have Adrian Peterson because you weren't thinking to handcuff him with that. If you can get him, I would. Adrian Peterson, Chris Thompson going to be the guys there. Uh, Tevin Coleman's thing with Matt Breida. I mean, Matt Breida and Raheem Moser both looked really good in that game this past weekend, so I would not be that concerned about uh, – I mean, if you can get one of them, I, I think you'd be fine there not having Tevin Coleman. Uh, and then my last one here, I forgot who was Mixon. Like I said, I'm not sure on Mixon. We, we haven't gotten really any – real results yet from that, but I mean, I've, I've talked about it all offseason, I think Giovanni Bernard was a guy you could get really late in drafts, or not dra- or was not drafted at all, dude can be a stud when Mixon's out, he proved it some last night as well, against the Seahawks having a really good game, uh, what, 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 what are your takeaways from some of these injuries, and which one is the most concerning for you? Yeah, and first, just an update, uh, I just saw posted to ESPN, Foles did go on IR. He will be eligible to return first week, would be November 17th, so probably uh, probably a lost season for the Jags. Uh, for the yeah. running backs, I think the most concerning is Geis. Um, you know, he missed all of his rookie year. A lot of people had put a lot of hopes and dreams into him, what he could be. Um, he was dealing with lingering injuries throughout the preseason, and now to have this pop up and he honestly did not look good yesterday in a day where the passing game was really prolific for Washington and where their offense actually had some bright spots. Ten carries for 18 yards. People said he didn't look right. I mean, obviously, this is why they kept Adrian Peterson. It's looking more like another lost season for him. And for the 49ers, they, you know, if if it weren't for bad luck with running backs, they'd have no luck at all. <laughs> They've never seen Jarek McKinnon play. You sign Tevin Coleman, he gets banged up. If you're right about Breed, it seems like he gets hurt every week and kind of bounces back. Just the revolving door. The one to keep an eye on probably for fantasy owners is Mixon. Hopefully um, they'll get some clarity on that. But I liked what I saw uh, from Gio and a little bit of his playing on Sunday. So if you've got him, hopefully uh, you're going to be in good shape. Yeah, yeah. I, I was someone who actually drafted Geo in most of the drafts that I was in just because of Mixon's injury history, and, and I, I loved what I saw. That was one of the games I kind of got fixated on late, especially I was watching the Cowboys-Giants, and then, well, that really turned out to not be a game much after, I would say, the first quarter. So I was really kind of switching back and forth between the the, the Bengals-Seahawks and Chargers-Colts, and those were both amazing games, and Giovanni Bernard there at the end of the game really looked good, uh, was giving the Bengals a chance to end up winning that game. The wide receivers, so we had quite a few star players here get injured. I'm going to start with um, the two ones that I, I'm not, at least right now, don't look that concerning. Uh, the lowest one being Juju. He had a toe injury last night. Uh, they, they did x-ray, MRI on it. Everything seems to be good. He's saying he'll be good for week two, uh, but they are saying that he likely won't practice much. So that's more of like a heads up on, hey, don't freak out if you see him not practicing a lot, but he should be good to play. It might be one of those things they have to manage for a little bit of time here. Uh, won't practice much. We'll do walkthroughs, and then we'll be fine to play every single week. So I personally, as someone who owns Juju in a couple leagues, not too worried there. Mike Williams, a knee injury. They haven't said much on that either, at least that I've saw. If, if you have, Matt, go ahead and, and correct me. But I, I haven't seen much on it, so I wouldn't worry too much about him. I know he really kind of sat out the rest of that game. I can't remember exactly when he got hurt, but he did miss the, the back end of that game. Uh, uh, so I would, I'm not too worried about it because I haven't seen anything serious come out, but it's definitely something worth watching, especially if you own Mike Williams, um, I, I really don't know of a handcuff for him, uh, and really not for Juju either. I mean, James Washington and Dante Moncrief are both likely owned in all leagues, and I can't imagine you're going out to pick up Travis Benjamin on the Chargers side. So uh, both those guys bear watching, but I don't think either one of them is serious enough that you have to worry too much. Uh, do, do you have any different thoughts on either of those injuries, Matt, before we move on to the big ones? No, I, I think uh... – Juju, I mean, it was near the end of the game, so hard to tell, but I think he'll probably be out there. And honestly, after what we saw from Dante Moncrief last night, I wouldn't feel that great about rolling him out yeah. in that spot. <laughs> anyway, Mike Williams more just kind of something that bears watching. He was a real trendy sleeper. A lot of people expecting him to take the leap this year, and these are the kind of things that can be a lingering setback where he doesn't miss any games but maybe limits his uh, ceiling. 
All right, so the big ones. Let's start with the, and I don't mean this in any kind of bad shot, but the guy who was not as fantasy relevant in Devin Funch's broken collarbone surgery likely, and I just saw a report earlier that if he does have the surgery, he's likely out for the season, if not most of the season. Uh, actually did look good at times yesterday in the game with yeah. Jacoby Brissett, but I'm not too worried about him. Uh, I mean, T.Y. Hilton, I think, really blew up. There with Jacoby Brissett, which not a lot of people were expecting. Again, we'll, we'll really dive into these games uh, when we do our recap episode. But a Paris Campbell, with, with a Funchess injury, if you own Funchess, if you're in a redraft league, and Campbell is available, he is a guy that I would look into getting. Phenomenal speed, really good route runner, uh, and, and I mean, is a, a yak monster. If he's a guy who could end up getting plugged into this Funchess role, could really start to have a, a huge uptick in a really good fantasy season uh, as a rookie wide receiver. Definitely someone I think could easily put up the numbers that Devin Funches did. Uh, Matt, your thoughts on the Funches injury and the Colts offense moving forward with likely without him for the rest of the season? Yeah, I think you have to count on him being gone. And uh, my first thought as somebody who picked up a lot of Paris Campbell shares uh, in Dynasty drafts is we might get a chance to kind of see what he can do and see if he can develop some chemistry with Jacoby Brissett. Um, I thought the Colts looked uh, pretty good yesterday, a lot more frisky than I thought they might look. Ebron and Doyle are there too, so I think they have options. Just kind of a bummer for Funches, who was kind of hoping to put it together. He was on a yeah. one-year prove-it deal, and uh, you know he looked good at times yesterday, and sadly that's probably all he's going to be able to show. Yeah, unfortunately. And then the last big one we saw, Tyree Kill. So this one was interesting to me because I actually didn't see the play. I saw him on the field, and they get they got him carted off. Uh, and I still haven't seen exactly what caused the injury. I saw, or I believe it was the play where he got tackled out of bounds. But yeah, from what right. I from what I heard, it was the the, the was it the clavicle or the yep clavicle. Yeah. So I guess it pushed into his chest plate and broke backwards not forward, and that can cause, apparently, obviously, cause some serious health issues inside of your body. That's why they rushed him to the hospital. Uh, and everybody was kind of confused because, again, a shoulder injury, you wouldn't necessarily relate that to having to go to the trauma unit, but it was that bad. Uh, they said that he didn't suffer any serious injuries beyond that, and he's likely going to be out six to seven weeks was, was what you have on here, and that was everything I've been seeing as well. So, yeah. Well, and I think that came on a quote. Uh, they had asked Sammy Watkins, yeah. what do they do to make up for it? And he said, well, we have to figure out for the next six to seven weeks. So Sammy obviously did not get the Andy Reid memo that we were we were staying mum on a time frame. <laughs> and he, he just answered the question honestly. But sometimes players do you favors there. And it sounds like um, that's probably why they're, they're not looking at putting him on. IR designated to return. They're hoping if he can get six weeks, they can maybe get him back the end of October and not have to wait till mid November. Yeah, that, that would honestly be good for him, the Chiefs, and, and fantasy owners. I, I mean, with that being said, I, as much as I hate to admit this because I've never been much of a Sammy Watkins believer, I think you've got to buy into him if you have him. I would not sell him at this point with with the chance of of him, uh, Hill being out for six to eight weeks. And I do think that you can probably build the hype back up for me, Cole Hardman, now. I think Hardman has a chance to come in and possibly run a little bit in this Tyree Kill uh, role while he's out. Everybody thought he was going to do good when Hill was suspended. Now he's going to be out six, seven weeks for the injury. I mean, if you had to choose between those two, uh, are you going Watkins or are you going to take a shot on, on Hardman? Well, I think Watkins is going to be kind of what he is uh, with teams game planning for him being the number one receiver. Um, well, I, I want to see him repeat it. We've seen Sammy Watkins explode, not maybe to the degree he did yesterday, but seen him explode in years past, and it doesn't always stay consistent. So Watkins is kind of what he is. He, you're definitely excited about him if you had him before. What I was more fascinated by yesterday, it didn't seem like Hardman was out there as much as Demarcus Robinson. Yeah. So I think it really bears watching who is going to be that other receiver? And obviously they didn't do a ton with Kelsey yesterday. I guess he had eight targets, but did three for 88. Um, he's all, he's always still there. So we'll have to kind of see how the passing offense goes. It might be one where aside from, from feeling good about being able to start Watkins, you're watching for a week or two to see who kind of develops. I think the opportunity is there for Hardman and for Robinson. Somebody's going to step up. 
I don't have a good feel after that game about who it's going to be. Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, I don't, I don't really like any of those guys. But I mean, with Patrick Mahomes throwing you the ball, someone's going to be fantasy relevant. I, I, a lot of people have been talking about Demarcus Robinson for years. He has yet to been able to, yet to be able to produce. Maybe it happens now with Tyreek Hill being out. But I agree with you. It's Bears watching those three and seeing who really takes another step forward here in week two, especially us knowing now Tyreek Hill is going to be out. So that is all of the, the key injuries. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, we have two Monday Night Football games today, the doubleheader like we always do kicking off the season. So we are going to jump right in and let's preview these Monday Night Football games. We eating all day, bro. <laughs> You every time, every time you come as well, I'm gonna hit you. I'm not gonna be able to do that. You don't want no problems, bro. You are my boy. I'm a man. I'm about to get ugly. I want to score. Yeah. You don't want to talk so much. It's time to do now. Not just a good old fashioned rear end whipping. To the house, baby. I'm in a league of my own. They ain't rest with me. Are you tired? Are you tired? Let's go. All right, so the first game we have here is between the Houston Texans and the New Orleans Saints, right? That's right, the first game? Am I looking at this wrong? Yep. Okay, I just want to make sure. All right, so game is supposedly going to be an offensive uh, track meet here. I I don't know necessarily if I believe in that because a lot of the games that were supposed to be high scoring, I mean, Browns, Titans, and the Titans did technically cover that all by themselves, so maybe – a lot of these will be, but I'm not sure it's going to be as quite as offensive heavy as a lot of people have. Uh, but let's start on the Texans side here. So the Texans defense uh, was a was a defense if you drafted early, a lot of people were expecting to be a top 10 fantasy defense. They are now doing this without Jadavion Clowney. I personally would drop them out of my top 10. What are your thoughts on their defense without Clowney? Yeah, I wouldn't have had them probably in my top 10 before Clowney got traded. I certainly don't now. They're, to me, they there's no way you can feel good starting them uh, tonight. They had some other issues. They had some struggles last year. Some of their best pieces of their secondary left in free agency this offseason. And as somebody who lived the Bradley Roby experience, if he's your cornerback one, there are going to be high highs and low lows. And I would not think opening night in – uh, New Orleans is a time where I want to take a chance that they've got their act together. All right, we also saw, obviously, they traded for Carlos Hyde. They have Duke Johnson there as well. I would imagine this is going to be more of like a 70-30 split toward Duke, especially with Duke have, having been there since week two of the preseason. Uh, Carlos Hyde coming over at the very end of the preseason, I'd imagine he has not had a chance to fully learn this playbook where Duke Johnson has We'll see what it is. I personally, I would not start either one of them if I didn't have to. If I had to choose one or the other, I would definitely go Duke Johnson just because of his versatility as well in, re- in the receiving game. Uh, your thoughts on this backfield, possible splits, and, and fantasy options for tonight? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't start Hyde either. I think we also have to take into account we need to see how the Texans' offensive line is coming together. It has only been a little over a week since they got Laramie Tinsel. Uh, how much has he been able to process and pick up? How is he fitting into that group? I actually do think this is going to be a little bit of a track meet, somewhat similar to the Buccaneers Saints opener that we saw uh, to start the 2008 season, a 2018 season. Um, so I think Duke probably is out there more too because he's more of a passing asset. I'd like to see what Hyde looks like running. If he's got any juice left in his legs, we don't really have a great feel from his last two stops, either the Jags at the end of last year or his time with. Kansas City so you, to me you need to see him before you feel comfortable I said in my preview today I think Duke is basically a flex play for me okay all right so let's move on to the wide receivers I mean DeAndre Hopkins is the easy one uh, there's not even a question I mean he could be playing on one leg is an and is an easy start even as a, a wide receiver one with as talented as he is the real question is going to come down to the other three wide receivers a lot of hype for Kiki Kuti going into the offseason or coming into the NFL season. Still been dealing with injuries. So is Will Fuller, and that's something I don't think we should overlook. Obviously had the ACL injury last year. Has been limited a lot in practice and in the preseason games this year. So, And, and the Bill O'Brien has come out and said we're just trying to limit his workload. 
and just kind of get him back in slowly. So it means he's likely not going to be out there the entire game. They did get Kenny Stills in that trade with Larry Tunsil as well, and they have come out and said that he is the clear backup to Will Fuller. So I imagine that means Stills is actually probably going to get a lot of playing time tonight because I don't think Will Fuller plays the whole game. That being said, do you feel comfortable starting any of these three as a flex option or wide receiver two slash three option tonight? I'd really prefer to see what the player rotation is going to be uh, before feeling confident about anything. I said in my preview, I think I would start, if if I had to pick, I would start Fuller as uh, something of a flex. He just has had such great rapport with Watson when they've been on the field together. And all it really takes, as we saw kind of similar to Lockett and Wilson yesterday in that Seahawks game, all it really takes for Fuller and Watson is one or two big hookups and he could make, you know, 10, 11 fantasy points. So I feel more confident with him as a flex than any of the others, but it's really hard to tell with the rotation and how they're dealing with injury. I mean, for a while, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it looked like Kuti may miss a few games to start the season. So the fact that it looks like he's tracking to play is a pretty remarkable turnaround there. But how confident can you really feel? Yeah, well, not confident at all for Kiki Kuti. I just got the message he is inactive for tonight. So we can we can already go ahead and not plug him in our lineups. Uh, I am with you on Will Fuller, though. I, regardless of him not playing as many snaps as we probably would like him to play, you just mentioned it. He's had a great rapport with Deshaun Walton since he's been out there, and all it takes is one play. I mean, he still has the speed to get by cornerbacks. If he gets by and Deshaun Walton lays a bomb on him, you just got your fantasy production from him in that one play, and that's all it's going to take. He gets a 50-yard touchdown. You just got 11 points out of him. That's that's all you can really ask for out of a flexor or wide receiver two uh, in fantasy, so you can get that all-on-one play. I, I would take Will Fuller and plug him into my uh, – into my flex spot any day of the week. Move on to the New Orleans Saints. So we've got, obviously, the Kamara and Latavius Murray backfield situation here. A lot of talk that Latavius Murray is actually coming in to play the Mark Ingram role, which I think is is definitely interesting. Obviously, Alvin Kamara is still a stud, especially in PPR, but his workload is not going to increase any. He's an obvious start regardless as an RB1. But what are your thoughts on Latavius Murray? Do you think he is worthy of an RB2 or flex start tonight? Yeah, I, I thought Kamara, uh, no, no brainer start, and I have him going in a few places, so I'm really hopeful there. Latavius Murray, I think he's worth a flex start. We saw uh, that this is an offense that can stay, sustain three, four, five people giving you usable fantasy stats when they're up and going good. And I I saw Murray last year. I thought he did some good work the last two years, actually, with Minnesota. I think he will fit into that role just fine and will provide them uh, some action. I, I wouldn't feel good if I had to rely on him as an RB1 or 2, but if yeah. I was looking for a flex with some upside, um, I would take a flyer on him. Yeah, I agree with you. As an RB2, I would not feel good about it, but as a flex option, absolutely. He's a guy who, who might be uh, have a lot of touchdown upside, I guess is the way to put it, because I do think they'll go to him some more in the red zone. We did see a lot of that with, with Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara at times, although Alvin Kamara actually had more red zone touches last year than Mark Ingram, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, but I like Murray as a flex option, a, a, a running back who I think if he is given a, a fair amount of carries and then some red zone work could actually put up some decent numbers for you in that flex spot. Uh, Michael Thomas, same as DeAndre Hopkins. He's an easy start there. There's not even a question for you. Uh, but they've got two other receiving options, one at wide receiver who a lot of people consider more of a best ball wide receiver in Ted Ginn, uh, and then you got Jared Cook at the tight end position. Uh, what are your thoughts on both of those guys tonight? Well, I'll start with Cook first. I actually have liked him all off season, and I liked him again this week. Uh, tight end is a shallow and somewhat unpredictable position. Um, I think we saw what he did and how well he fit into that Raiders system. That was the reason the Saints went out and got him. Um, I could actually see him being the true second receiving option, although probably third in line for targets if you're counting Kamara. Um, Ted Ginn is probably a less sexy Will Fuller to me. He's another guy that all it takes is one or two plays for him to make a flex night um, in deeper leagues, especially deeper um, PVR leagues where if you get return yardage as an option, I would 
uh, take a flyer on Ginn. I have him in a 16-team pretty deep league, and I'm playing him at my second flex this week because I thought he had a better uh, chance of putting up a number than Anthony Miller, and since Miller gave me zero, I'm still hoping that's the case. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on Cook. Um, my my illustrious co-host, Mr. Dennis Bennett, is uh, – opposite of us on that he does not think Jared Cook coming over to this offense is going to be that good uh but I agree with what you said a tight end is just such a bad position in fantasy for the most part and what we saw him do with Derek Carr I don't think it's an argument that Drew Brees is better than than Derek Carr and this offense is going to be better than what we saw in Oakland so I think Jared Cook has a chance to get off to a rock solid start in this game with it being expected to be a shootout uh, and I think he's going to have a great season all year long Ted Ginn, um, I'm with you. That's why I kind of I, I called him the best ball wide receiver because he's a phenomenal best ball wide receiver. He's a guy that I, much like Deshaun Jackson, uh, I don't feel comfortable plugging into my lineup every week. But the week that he does go off, you're going to feel great about it because he's going to get you a lot of points. And I do think that tonight is going to be one of them. Again, if if you expect it to be this track meet shootout that we've been talking about, and everybody seems to think it is. Ted Ginn's a great start tonight because that Houston secondary is by far the weakest part of their defense. And now you got Teddy Ballgame running back there. I imagine they're going to key in on Michael Thomas, which is going to leave Jared Cook in the middle of the field open and probably Ted Ginn deep. And Drew Brees, we have seen, is not afraid to sling it down the field to Ted Ginn. Uh, so this is one of those games where I would feel safe and fine starting him in a flex spot um, tonight, expecting him to do some good things. All right, so that right. Let's 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 just jump right in and do it. Who are you picking to win the first game here? Houston Texans or the New Orleans Saints? I got the Saints at home. I can't remember who I picked in our our pick 'em, so I'm hoping that I picked the Texans because I think that they're going to pull this one off. But if I pick the Saints, at least I cover both of my bases on that one, so we're good to go. <laughs> let's move on to the uh, the late night game, one that I am extremely interested in watching. And that is the Denver Broncos and the Oakland Raiders. So I put on this note here, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it because I know, obviously, and everybody who's been listening here the past couple weeks, that you are a huge Denver Broncos fan. Vic Fangio coming over from the Chicago Bears. We saw that defense did not look quite the same Thursday night against the Packers since he left. I think him coming over with a lot of really good defensive pieces that the Broncos have. This defense could have a chance to be a top five fantasy defense this year, and especially tonight against the Oakland Raiders. What do you got on the Broncos defense? Well, first, I looked it up so you can feel better. You did pick the Texans in your yes! official six that we published. Thank you. Um, I think the defense is going to be really good. They were actually uh, really good at times last year. Just They were left on the field a lot. They were put in a lot of crappy short field situations because of the turnovers. The real question is, can the offense support them a little bit better? I'm very excited uh, to see what this defense can do. We actually never saw it all together in the preseason. Callahan didn't play. Jackson didn't play. They barely played Vaughn and and Bradley Chubb. One of the things I'm very excited about is our second-team defensive line and our second-team outside linebackers played a lot, and they looked very good when they were out there, too. One of the big challenges when you go into these first game or two is the conditioning. I think we saw that if you watched Arizona and Detroit, where Detroit was just caving the, the Arizona line in for the first three quarters, and in the fourth quarter, they just couldn't get anything going because they didn't have enough depth. I think the Broncos have worked really hard to improve that depth up front. One of the big questions still is going to be uh, inside linebacker Todd Davis. Our starter got hurt in July and still hasn't been available. It looks like he's tracking not to play tonight or even week two. So there's a few questions there, but I'm very excited to kind of finally see this remade secondary to see Bradley Chubb and Von Miller turn loose. You got the sense that they weren't even really – uh, going all out with their playbook in the preseason, but I think we saw in that uh, one quarter that they played against the 49ers in Week 2 what they did to Jimmy G, who couldn't even complete a pass for positive yardage. I'm really excited to what, to see what they do uh, opening night tonight in Oakland. All right, so you've got, obviously, um, we'll skip the, the wide receivers for a minute, move on to the GOAT in Phillip Lindsay. And uh, Royce Freeman, how do you expect the time split to be tonight for those two? 
I think it's going to be a fairly even split. I, I think Lindsay will get you good yardage, and he should be more involved in the passing game than he was last year. But Freeman's still going to come in there, still going to have his series, and I think he's probably more of a factor when you get into the red zone and near the goal line. Um, I think they're both flex play starts. Um, you know, neither of them played a whole ton in the preseason, but when they did go out there with Flacco, both of them looked good at times. The real question is whether the work Mike Munchak and John Elway put in over the offseason to make, remake the offensive line has worked. And if it has, um, you know, we never saw the five starting offensive linemen play together in the preseason. Ronald Leary is supposed to be available to play tonight, so it'll be interesting to see how that group works together uh, and if they can open up the holes against the Raiders. With the wide receivers, you've got three guys that are all, I mean, extremely interesting in my opinion. Obviously, Emmanuel Sanders, some people are going to have the injury question on him with with what he, uh, coming back from the Achilles injury late last year too, although he did look good in that preseason three game, uh, and and this will be kind of his first true test against a, a team that's actually going to be trying to win. Not that preseason games you're not trying to win, but I think that's more just trying to get your work in. Uh, Cortland Sutton, who I think is a, has phenomenal talent, but we've just not seen a lot at him. Kind of a quiet preseason. And then Deshaun Hamilton, who I think is a, a phenomenal possession receiver. I'm not sure really fits into Joe Flacco's game per se. Uh, what do you got on these three tonight? Who do you think has, has a good game for fantasy? I think if I had to choose, the only one I feel very confident starting is Emmanuel Sanders. Okay. Um, he's a veteran. He looked explosive when he did play. None of them really played much, and Flacco didn't play much. None of them, you know, they a couple of them played a few plays in, in the first week, full week of preseason, and then they played that quarter or so against the 49ers in week two. No starters or really even the top four receivers for the Bronco played week three or four of the preseason. So it's been a while um, not really seeing a lot of what they can do. I think Sanders um, was the one I felt the most confident in. His presence on the field opens things up a little bit more for Sutton and Hamilton, who will not have coverage go to them. Um, But it's going to be interesting to see in a game that quarter that they played Flacco really looked for those three receivers. I know it's been trendy for people to think tight end is going to be a huge position for Denver, but personally for me, I'm staying away from the Broncos tight ends. All three of the guys that we have were banged up in the preseason at different times, including Noah Fant. I think they're all going to play in a rotation. I think that is fantasy wasteland right now. Um, I think all three of the receivers could have value. Sanders is the one I feel the best about. And he, I actually, I know this is going to shock you greatly, have a lot of Broncos receivers on my various fantasy teams, and Sanders has been the one I've been leaning on starting for this week one. All right, on the Oakland wide receivers, uh, obviously no Antonio Brown now, and, and going up against a fairly good Denver Broncos secondary, Tyrell Williams looks to be the lock now to be the number one there. Is there anybody else besides maybe Hunter Renfro, or do you even trust Hunter Renfro? Anyone out of these guys that you would trust starting tonight outside of Tyrell Williams? And what are your thoughts on Tyrell Williams tonight? Honestly, for me, Williams is a stay away for this first week because he's the only big name receiver. I think uh, he's going to be seeing a lot of uh, Chris Harris and Kareem Jackson, who's playing safety for us now. Um, I actually think if you were looking for sneaky value, I'd like to see what Renfro can do, but um, he he is the receiver I think might actually have a better game of the, of the two. But the one I think in their passing game that I'm most interested to see is Darren Waller. The Broncos have not been able to cover tight ends very well the last few years, and we've seen how Derek Carr used the tight end last year. Um, everybody's been talking about how great Waller's been in camp, and he's the one that I actually feel the best about starting out of the Raiders passing game tonight. All right, so you heard it here first. Matt Fox calling for Darren Waller to be the number one tight end in fantasy this week. Just kidding. Uh, Josh Jacobs, your thoughts on him tonight? I am, I've not been bullish on him all offseason, and I think Kim going up against this Denver front line and linebackers is not going to end well for him tonight. So what are, what are your thoughts on his first start to his rookie campaign? Yeah, I think it's going to be a tough night, a little bit of tough sledding in there. I actually think you may end up getting a better running back performance out of Jalen Richard, who's going to be kind of the dump off uh, for the same reason that I like Waller. Uh, I think the deep secondary is a problem. 
that they're going to have to overcome. There's still going to be a lot of pressure from the defensive line and the outside linebackers. The real weak spot in that Denver defense right now is inside linebacker, which means backs coming out of the backfield and tight end over the middle. Other than that, I think it's going to be some tough sledding for Carr. And for this entire team, who basically their entire offseason and their preseason was spent designing an offense around a receiver and a player that they didn't get to work with that much, but who they always thought was going to be there until yeah. Saturday. Yeah. All right, well, to me, it sounds like you are leaning toward your hometown Denver Broncos. Is that who you're picking tonight to win? Yep, I was picking Denver before the Antonio Brown fiasco, and I think that's going to make it just that much tougher for the Raiders. I'm right there with you. I've got the Broncos winning as well. So, Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we'll, we will jump on again here soon, and, and we will preview all of the games, uh, including the Monday night games tomorrow. Have a, have a wonderful Monday night football experience tonight, and we will talk again soon. Yep, sounds good. Talk to you later. Prepare for glory! I don't know if you got your popcorn ready. Do you got your popcorn ready? I came out the wall line already. And he's hit the end zone for an unbelievable touchdown. I would be honored if you played football for this team. Throw it up above his head. They can't jump with me. Golly! Only tackle in the 40-yard line. Who can make a play? I can. Who can make a play? I can. <laughs> There's a right time to find out if you have the right insurance. And it's not when you have a fender bender or frozen pipes. No, the best time is before something goes wrong. Like when you first talk to a AAA insurance agent. And they're taking the time to get to know what you need. So that if the unexpected happens to your car or home, you won't get unexpected answers. Talk to a AAA insurance agent at your local AAA store today. Or visit AAA.com insurance to learn more about AAA. There's a right time to find out if you have the right insurance. And it's not when you have a fender bender or frozen pipes. No, the best time is before something goes wrong. Like when you first talk to a AAA insurance agent. And they're taking the time to get to know what you need. So that if the unexpected happens to your car or home, you won't get unexpected answers. Talk to a AAA insurance agent at your local AAA store today. Or visit AAA.com insurance to learn more about AAA.